الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين وعلى اله واصحابه وازواجه وذرياته اجمعين اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم واذا سالك عبادي عني فاني قريب اجيب دعوه الداعي اذا دعان فليستجيبوا لي وليؤمنوا بي لعلهم يرشدون قال الله تعالى في مقام الآخر يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله ولتنظر نفس ما قدمت لغد واتقوا الله إن الله خبير بما تعملون بارك الله لنا ولكم في القرآن العظيم ونفعنا وإياكم بالآيات والذكر الحكيم إنه تعالى جباد كريم ملك بر الرؤوف الرحيم. My respect to the elders, brothers, sisters, and listeners of Radio Dawn. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Amongst the many beautiful names of Allah. Is Al Qudus. Al Qudus, the most holy one. What does this mean, the most holy one? One of understanding of this is that Allah is the one who is beyond our comprehension, beyond our imagination, yet so special, so intimate. So close to us that نحن أقرب إليه من حمل الوليد. Allah says, I am closer to you than your own jugular vein. In other words, I'm closer to your to you than your own life. Yet he is بعيد. He's very very far and remote. We can't lay our hands. We can't. Our eyes cannot grasp him. Our imaginations can really not even. Have an inkling of what this wonderful Creator and Lord is. He is Al Qudus. But I thought, when we read these beautiful names of Allah and we learn them and we understand them, the point is that we too should have some share of that, as Imam Ghazali in his beautiful book Asma Al Husna talks about that. So what is the share of man in this? How can you be a Qudsi? You know, we sometimes talk about the angels being Qudsi and holy. How can man be holy as such? Well, yes, man can be holy. Man should be holy. Okay, man should be sacred, and man should have some things of that as well in him. Why? Because one afaktu fi him min ruhi. Honors humanity with this great status that I blew my own spirit into him, and through that, Adam alayhi salam gained that sacredness, gained that dignity and honor. So much so that the angels had no choice but to bow and prostrate before him, because he now had the spirit of God in him. Man too, every man. Allah has blessed him with His own soul, and that is what makes man qudsi. But of course, man is supposed to be qudsi. His nature is pure and qudsi. But sadly, he succumbs to the temptations. He is seduced by the shaitan. He is tempted by his own nafs, and he is he is guiled and deceived by the world to such an extent that. He actually succumbs to it. He becomes worldly. He becomes thick. He becomes material. He becomes physical, and he loses his that qudsiyah that he had in him, that holiness he has in him. Well, 
Fasting is a wonderful exercise in once more making us that light, transparent, putsi being, really. You know, we live and we depend on food. We need this energy to keep us alive, you know. We constantly need these calories and the energy to drive our cells and to drive our bodies to work, really. Without that, we would not live. So man needs this. But sometimes we become too obsessed with it, to such an extent that we are completely dependent on it. And not only that, we pay and focus all our attentions on that, on our hungers, on our physical needs. Fasting is a wonderful exercise, brothers and sisters, that reminds us that, no, there is another side of you, the Qudsi side of you, that you too have to share, that you have to remember, and you should focus on that. Our society is a society of affluence, a society that is rich in material resources, and as a consequence, sadly, we today are obsessed with material things. And fasting is a beautiful antidote, a powerful antidote to that disease of materialism, of consumerism, of food, of drink. Why do you think, you know, we have nearly 50% of obesity, 50% of the public community is today more than it, it has higher weight. You know, we have these midriffs, we have these pot bellies, and we have all this. Why? Because of this abundance and affluence, really. And we seem to be obsessed with it. We seem to be controlled by it, sadly. Many people are controlled by it. Fasting is a wonderful exercise that actually frees us from this obsession in many ways, really. And reminds us that there is another side. So when we, inshallah, you know, during this last 16 days, and we're fast approaching, you know, the end of this wonderful uh, month and the last ashra, it, it seems that now our bodies have adjusted, have accepted this reality now, that yes, there is something else. We need to be paying attention to our soul. We need to be paying attention to our heart. We need to be paying attention to our Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in remembrance, there is true itmenah, true solace, and true peace. Allah the Quran makes this proclamation that through the remembrance of God, hearts and mind find true peace. Only, only true peace and solace comes through that remembrance of God. And I hope, you know, through our proper fasting, and this is a condition, you know, and that is what, what Rasulullah meant when he said that Mansama, uh, Ihtisab, Imanan wa Ihtisaban that when the one who fasts with this consciousness, with this awareness, and with the manners, and with the runes that go with fasting, he is the one who is going to properly benefit from it. And of course it requires effort. And alhamdulillah, you know, people are exerting a lot of effort, mashallah. You know, I see people, I know people here who work 8 to 10 hours a day. Hard work sometimes. Some labors, some in their taxis, some in their restaurants, some uh, in the factories, and some in the shops. And yet, they fast with that due diligence and love. And then, in the evenings, they can stand before Allah, you know, for two hours, to listen to the glorious Quran. You know, we see lots of you people, mashallah, lots of them, you know, spending eight or ten hours working hard and then standing before their Lord. Inna Allah ala yudhiyu adilat muhsidi. Allah does not waste. The work of those who are righteous, inshallah, does this. So brothers, let us take advantage, you know, of these wonderful moments, you know, of worship and this great time of Ramazan, the spring of righteousness, really. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, during the last 10 days, as Aisha radiallahu anha narrates that, during the last 10 days, he used to cut himself off completely from everybody. And he used to do the i'tiqaf. 
it offers this <coughs> retreat, spiritual retreat, where you leave everyone, your social contacts, your home, and you sit in the house of Allah, in the Bayt Allah, in the Haram of Allah, in that wonderful daughter of Allah, of, of, of Kaaba Allah. You know, the mosques are the daughters of Kaaba Allah. You sit there as though you are sitting at the doorstep of the king, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You sit there seeking his pleasure and his forgiveness. It appears as though Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa of course, worked very hard during the Ramadan. Twenty days, you know, his spirituality was at its height. And it, it, it reached its climax in the last ten days. And here is a lesson for us as well, that our 20 days of fasting, which has now made us spiritual person, person who is in touch and connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the point really, you know, being connected with God, remembering Allah, and really wanting to come even more closer to Allah. Now one feels that I have to break off my relations with the rest of the world outside world and now I will engage myself and absorb myself in the love of God through his remembrance in his house. That is Eitakaf. You know where literally Eitakaf actually means to do something diligently. You know to do something with full concentration and focus. And here the worshipper, the devotee, puts his effort, all his focus and concentration in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> and therefore, you know, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa throughout his life, the last, you know, 10 years, he spent every Ramadan in Etaqaf. And this is really to teach us that, you know, we too should now and then give up our, you know, give up our worldly contacts and keep, take ourselves away from the hustle bustle of the life, from the noise and the distractions of life. It's a temporary uh, dissociation, but a very important one. You know, when you look at the lives of the prophets, you will see that every prophet did this retreat. And of course, all the saints and the people of God have always done retreats. And even today, you know, those people who are in touch with God want to do that retreat. Some, of course, would do it in the form of going to Hajj or Umrah, okay? That in itself is a fantastic, wonderful retreat, but of course a very expensive one, very costly one. And here, sitting in the house of Allah, it's much cheaper, you know, very easy. In fact, it is, you know, it doesn't cost you anything, really. But it is a powerful means, really. I know there are many, many Christians who actually go on spiritual retreats. They have spiritual retreat centers all over the country. There are literally hundreds of them. And we Muslims really need to learn that. For us, the spiritual retreat is of course the Bayt Allah, the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, Eitqaf is of three kinds. You have the Eitqaf, which is fun. Whenever you make a pledge that if such and such thing happens for me, if Allah fulfills my demand and my prayer, I will then sit a day or two days Eitqaf that then becomes a fart on you. You have to do that. And you know, let us get into that, those sort of pledges. You know, let us get into those bargaining with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, we bargain with one another in our worldly lives, don't we? You know, you, I will do this for you, you pay me this. I will do this, you give me this. We, we should do the same with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now and then. That's wonderful. You know, it's a sign of a strong relationship. You know, you say to God, Allah, fulfill my dream. Fulfill my wish and I will do this in order to serve you, in order to be your devotee. And that's the Eitqaf which is fun. Then there is the Eitqaf which is Sunnah. The Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Because anything that the Prophet did becomes a beautiful pattern of lifestyle for us. And there can be no better lifestyle than life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So whatever the Prophet did, is perfect, is acceptable to Allah, it is maqbool in the sight of God, and it's always full of blessings and barakah. 
it has a spiritual influence for us, inshallah, Aziz. So brothers, this is one of the great sunnahs, you know, of the awliya Allah and of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa of all the awliya. So I really urge you, those who haven't had the taste of this, try to sit the iqaf. If you can't do the full nine or ten days iqaf, then think about doing the nafal iqaf. One day, two day, or a weekend. Next weekend, inshallah, Aziz, I will be running a special class here during the Eidqaf from Friday to Sunday. Those who want to learn the, inshallah, you will, you will have a fantastic opportunity to learn your deed. Okay, so please plan for that. This isn't for little kiddies, all right? See, it's interesting that whenever I say I'm going to do this teaching, I'm going to do this lessons, or I'm going to do that, this, that, everybody thinks, oh, it's for little kids. Or it's for the young ones, it's not for me. Brothers, who amongst you is not in need of spiritual regeneration? Who amongst you is one who doesn't need any knowledge, further knowledge? Even if you are more knowledgeable than me, alhamdulillah, I think you can still teach me and I can learn from you when you are sitting in my company, inshallah. And I do learn from people. So, but who is, you know, who is here, who is independent of knowledge and of learning and of worship? Is there anybody? Brothers, think seriously about doing the nafal iqtab at least. And whenever we do lessons, they are for everybody, every one of us. Whether you are 80 years old, whether you are 40 years old, whether you are 20 or 10 years old, everybody needs to learn. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his, this, in his gatherings he used to have the old ones, the young ones, the children as well, everybody. And this is what, you know, when we talk about the generation gap, you know, we complain that our young people are really out of tune with us. They don't see eye to eye with us. Why? Because we don't spend time with them. They don't spend time with us. You know, we have, we have divided our lives. We have compartmentalized our lives. And that is not good. You know, we need to be, all of us, old and young, sitting together. You know, we don't say, you know, we will have something for young and we will have something for the old only and they can't mix. That should not be the case. The old ones should always be there to guide the young ones. The young ones there to get the blessings and the, and the pleasure of their elderly as well. And that is very important, you know, I think the young people too need to understand this. Okay? They think that we are independent. Okay? Yes. Islam grants you independence, undoubtedly. It has, God has made you a free being. But it has made you interdependent. You need others. You cannot be on your own and be successful. So brothers, think about doing the Iqaf with me. Inshallah, the Sunnah Iqaf starts on Tuesday after Maghrib. And will continue till, of course, the day of, uh, or the, the night of uh, Eid. And those who want to do the Nafal, Inshallah, next Friday, I, I, I hope you will be able to join me and I'll, I'll tell you more about that. But Itqaf is a wonderful, wonderful exercise. And if you want to learn more about it in my book, you can read more about it. But let me just quote you one. Here is what the Zad al Ma'ad says about the benefits of Itqaf. The heart becomes attached to Allah Ta'ala. One attains inner composture and equanimity. The preoccupation with the mundane things of life ceases and absorption in the eternal reality takes its place. And the state is reached in which all fears, hopes and apprehensions are superseded into the anxiety for him and every thought and feeling is blended with the eagerness to gain Allah's nearness. Devotion to Almighty is developed and it grows instead of the devotion to the world. So it's an antidote to the excessive materialism, you know, that we are absorbed in a lot of the time. Thus it becomes the provision for the grave where there will be neither friend nor helper. This is the lofty purpose of Uqqaf. Imam Shah Waliullah, rahmatullahi, one of the great muhaddis of Delhi, says that Uqqaf in the masjid is a means to peace of mind and purification of the heart. And it is an excellent opportunity of forging an identity with the angels and having a share in the barqa of the Laylatul Qadr and for devoting oneself to prayer and meditation. This is a sunnah for the pious and the virtuous slaves. So brothers, let us inshallah, you know, try to do our best. 
Another of the activities of Rasulullah in Ramadan, most oft repeated activity, was that he used to do infaq fi sabilillah. He used to spend more in the month of Ramadan. Aisha radiallahu anha and says that Rasulullah was the most generous of all. But during the month of Ramadan, he became ajwal nas, you know, even more generous than anyone in Ramadan. And here is another, I think, a great opportunity and activity that we should be engaged in. Of course, the Ummah, Muslims are, alhamdulillah, very generous people. You know, during this month, we raise millions here in this country. And we raise it for helping our, our deprived brothers and sisters all over the world, those who are suffering, whether suffering from natural, natural disasters or man-made disasters. We are there to help them, alhamdulillah. And you make huge contributions to that, to that. I know that. But one thing, you know, we must never forget, brothers. Our needy brothers in Pakistan, Kashmir, Palestine and Africa are very worthy cause. We must always help them. But brothers, remember that the deen of Allah needs to establish and it needs to take roots in this country as well. It needs to have its own institutions. It needs to have its own workers here. Without that, brothers, how will we have a generation of people who will know their deen? Already, let me be very frank with you, already our daughters are lost. Muslim girls and women are lost from Islam to a large extent. And here we have to be thankful to our sky channels, who, in some case, which are helping them to, to, to be educated. Otherwise, what am I doing for them? What is this masjid doing for them? What are you doing for our girls? Very, very little brothers. And remember, it is the mother who determines the goodness of her child. If tomorrow we don't have good Muslim mothers and daughters, where is the Muslim generation going to come from? Brothers, I really urge you to think deeply and support us you know, in establishing our schools here, in establishing our Dawa works here. The Institute is really dedicated to that. It is working very hard to do that. But Alhamdulillah, you are supporting. But I don't see many conscientiously even appreciating or even knowing what we are doing. You know, for example, the Invitation Magazine goes to at least 30 odd thousand readers every two months. Just imagine how much influence it has. And, but very, very few people here have ever contributed a penny towards it. Yet for years, for 21 years now, many of you have been reading it. I'm not blaming anybody here. I'm just pointing out a fact, brothers. And you can see how lonely I feel and my group sometimes feel. Where is our community gone? What is that sense of responsibility? Who is to carry that responsibility for you? And what support are you giving to that person who's carrying your burden for you? First of all, nobody can carry your burden. Everybody will go in his own grave. You will take with you your own deeds. But brothers, by ourselves we cannot do things. Not in this world, this, this part of the world certainly. We need to be organized, we need to be disciplined. And that discipline requires organizations. It requires institutions, brothers. Yes, let us support the Pakistanis in their time of misery. Let us support the Palestinians in time of their wretchedness. But let us not forget our girls who are in a state of greater wretchedness, about to lose their faith. Our young men are populating the prisons of this country. And, to, to, and they embarrass us when we look at those figures. And, you know, we really are becoming the underdogs of this society. The only way to tackle that is, brother, to have strong institutions, to have social workers who are, who are inclined and who know their need, is to have guys who can help and youth workers who can help our teenagers, delinquent teenagers from their evil ways, who can bring them to Allah's deed. We need to have our own imams, you know, who can, who can communicate with our young generation. All that requires sadaqa. It all requires your support, brother. So don't forget the work that we are doing here. Inshallah, we will start, we will start the Masjid al-Shifa's campaign. And Masjid al-Shifa is, alhamdulillah, at the forefront of doing dawah. You know, out of the 100,000 pounds that you annually give to Masjid al-Shifa, uh, you will be pleased to see that 
more than 60% of that, and we can show you figures, inshallah, is going directly into Dawa. Into Dawa. It's not going to, into bricks and mortar. It's going into direct Dawa, inshallah, Aziz. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to recognize our responsibilities. Allah is al Quddus, the holy, the most sacred, the most sublime. Are we too going to become the sacred, the holy ones who are under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's throne on the day of judgment? Wa akhru da'wana and alhamdulillah